now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Harry Fuller. Harry has lived in Oregon since 2007, first in Ashland, then McMinnville, and just this summer he moved to Salem. He has been a Christmas bird count leader for Salem Audubon more than once and is now a member of our chapter and is one of our field trip committee members. I know from birding alongside Harry that he's an expert birder and willing to help others with any kind of bird identification problem. He's the type of birder who even knows all the gulls. And <laughs> if they are juveniles, he even knows how old they are by their by the year their feathers indicate. Also, I know if there's a huge flock of birds either on the ground or overhead, Harry can guess by estimating and probably be within 10 birds of the correct number. Harry's profession before retirement was managing TV and internet newsrooms in both San Francisco and London. Both before and after retirement, he has worked as both a volunteer and a professional birding guide. Currently, he leads trips at Malheur Field Station and Klamath Bird Observatory, plus trips in closer locations for Salem Audubon. He has published three natural history books, The Great Gray Owl in California, Oregon, and Washington, Freeway Birding, San Francisco to Seattle, and San Francisco's Natural History, Sand Dunes to Streetcars. He also contributed a chapter on common nighthawks in the book Edge of Awe, an anthology of essays about Malheur National Wildlife Refuge and the Steens Mountains. Tonight, Harry's program is titled Hot Times, Their Money or Your Life, and concentrates on climate change and how it is affecting all creatures, especially Oregon's birds. Harry, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Let's see if we can get this thing open. Looks good. Okay, why can't I see it? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no, I can see it. Yeah, I wonder why I can't. Anybody got any ideas? Tim, where are you? Check your view options, Harry. You might. You uh, might where are they? Uh, you're on a PC? Yeah. The upper right hand corner, there's a thing called view. Upper right hand corner. And just go to the standard view. Hmm. And click on that little view icon and then go to standard. I uh, got normal. How's that? No, we haven't had this happen before, uh, Harry. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to remove the spotlights. It's, it's see if clearly that open. Does that help? Well, no. we can see it. Can you see it on your computer? No, that's the problem. Oh, here we go. Oh, there good. you go. All right. <laughs> good. All right. Uh, how do I? Oh, maybe I can. Now, you guys are in front of my thing. If I can re reduce the. How do I get rid of the Zoom? Oh, here we go. I've moved it off. Okay. Um, Shouldn't all of our pictures, our faces be off the screen now? It depends on what you have for your view setting, uh, Judy. Oh, okay. I have spotlighted him. So if you go to the speaker view, you'll just see him. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm ready. Sorry about that. A little uh, technical difficulty. We're going to talk about uh, climate change sort of as a general issue on our planet, but particularly talk about what it means for birds. So why is it not letting me go down? Hmm. Now I don't know what's... I've got the thing up, but it won't... Wait. 
There we go. Okay, what can we expect? A lot, most of this stuff we already know, I'm not gonna waste a lot of time on it, but the seas are getting more acidic as a result of both heat and acid, uh, coral reefs are dying. We're gonna see more extreme weather. Gee, I can't imagine that. Forest fires, uh, and it's gonna change the phenology, the way plants and animals deal with the weather and the climate, uh, particularly plants. Uh, many of them are quite flexible and they're gonna adjust instantly to, or at least very quickly to what's going on in terms of heat and rain. A uh, classic example in our area is the mushrooms that come up out of the ground from plant roots. And if it rains really hard in late September, all of a sudden there's mushrooms. If it doesn't rain into early December, same mushrooms you would have seen in September will wait. They wait until the weather is right and then they come out and bloom. And they're a classic example of the way plants are going to adjust to climate change. The ones that can. The ones that can't obviously will disappear. What we're going to see is more and more plants and animals, insects and diseases coming north from the tropical area. Uh, they're already worried about dengue fever coming across the border and there's no, no way a wall or anything else is going to stop it. Uh, West Nile virus is the most recent example of what used to be a much more uh, tropical or subtropical disease that's now basically spread all the way across the United States and probably the most serious single effect on things that live is just stress. There's gonna be all kinds of change. There's gonna be unpredictability. There's gonna be things that plants and animals haven't dealt with very often, and they're gonna happen more often. And it's just gonna create enormous amount of stress. Uh, what we went through last summer, we hope it doesn't happen again, at least during our lifetimes and maybe not even our grandchildren's lifetimes but smoke is going to be one of the things that's going to cause great problems over huge areas. This is what Oregon and the coast looked like about two and a half, three months ago. Uh, and this is gonna cause both stress and starvation. I'm sure you all read the stories of the migrants falling out of the sky along the front range of the Rocky Mountains and then down into the Southwest because they were getting up in the air and there was nothing to eat and their lungs were filling up with smoke. 2019 was the last state of the birds report. It's persisted in spite of the Trump administration. Uh, and two of the conclusions in that report, Western forest birds have been very hard hit by climate and habitat loss. Uh, the dying off of the pine trees is just one of the most uh, egregious examples of what our forest birds are having to deal with. And grassland birds across the United States are suffering. A lot of this is not directly due to climate change, but much more to habitat loss, uh, but drought makes it worse. This Eastern meadowlark, which is a bird I grew up with in the Midwest, it was extremely common. Sometimes I'd see 30 or 40 of them in a single day on our little farm, is disappearing. Other things that the state of the birds pointed out, federal agents are, are still participating. So it means if there is a change in administration, which is what we're expecting at this point, the federal agencies are geared up and ready to get back in full swing. Over one third of the U.S. breeding species now are considered to be in serious decline. I mentioned the grassland birds. Some of the causes, in addition to climate change, habitat destruction, predators, and pollution, much of it due to agriculture. Some species are doing much better. It shows that direct, concentrated human help really does work. A lot of ducks are doing reasonably well. Uh, some animals have come back way better than they were, say, in the 1970s. Uh, osprey, bald eagles, brown pelicans are examples of birds that we've done a really good job of helping recover from their low point in population. So the lesson is, if we pay attention and are willing to spend the time and money, we can do, make a big difference. I'm afraid this is a really downer slide. <laughs> so 1974, ready turnstones have gone down 80%. Shorebirds overall are down more than a third in the last 50 years. Uh, some of the species losses since 1970, 180 million juncos. Fortunately, you can still go out on a bird trip and if somebody sees a junco, so you know, that's one of the few birds on the planet that outnumbers people still. Red-winged blackbirds down 100 million, bank swallows down. Horned larks, by the way, there are horned larks on Livermore Road about three miles north of Smithfield, if you want to go out and see some, in a field full of pipits, and there were savannah sparrows there too. 
Overall, grassland birds are down more than 50% in the last 50 years. Habitat schedule changes, I mentioned that a little bit. Habitat is changing not just because of drought and heat uh, and the plants trying to react to it, but also because of insects that are much more prolific now. Winters are much milder. Uh, there's a direct relationship between warm winters and the pine beetles ability to spread and outnumber uh, what it used to be. Uh, and the insectivores just can't keep up with it. So it's killing ponderosas all across the Western United States. That's one of the reasons that the fires were so bad in Colorado this fall was they had so many dead pine trees. Uh, and I mentioned West, My West Nile, that's just an example of a organism that wasn't even here 30 years ago. It almost wiped out the uh, yellow-billed magpie in California when it first hit the state about 15 to 20 years ago. Some plants will do really well. They'll spread really fast. They like the heat. Maybe they're drought resistant. Others are going to have a difficult time and may even disappear. Breeding and migration will change for some species. Uh, local birds that don't have to migrate may start breeding earlier. Uh, and they may breed later in the summer when it starts to cool off a little bit as well. Uh, we're now seeing often in September swallows, barn swallows still nesting as late as Labor Day. They'll have babies in the nest. That wouldn't have been going on 50, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, some birds can adjust their migration. We all know that there are some birds that they sort of migrate, but what they really do is they travel around looking for food. Flickers are like that, Lewis's woodpeckers, pine siskins, juncos, waxwings. So those birds are going to be pretty flexible. The bird that has to get up in the air and head to Mexico or Costa Rica or Venezuela, uh, or the Swainson's hawk that's got to head down to the Andes to hunt insects over our winter, those birds are going to have a much harder time adjusting to migration. I think what we're going to see is some birds that do short-term migration, that either come down from the mountains or go, say, from Oregon to California, those birds may start to adjust. Um, I think turkey vultures probably 30, 40 years from now in Osprey will be very common in the Willamette Valley, even in January, because they don't go that far and they tend to get pushed by the weather. But birds that go up and fly 200 miles in a night and then spend three days restoring their body and then do another 200 miles, it's gonna be really hard for them to adjust, really, really hard. Old patterns will not hold for many species and the question is gonna become who can adapt and who can't. Earlier nesting, I mentioned that migration pattern shifts. Uh, we're also seeing changes in winter and we'll talk about that a little more, which birds winter over winter and where do they winter. Distribution shifts as breeding ranges expand or contract. Some birds are moving north. Chestnut back chickadee now is more common in the northern part of its range than it used to be in San Diego where it's basically gone. So it's following the fog uh, and the cooler weather north and east. Human intervention, if we save habitat, uh, that may work, but we've also got to focus on what each individual endangered species is going to need and that number is going to get greater and greater. So just saving a marsh may not be enough for a particular species of duck or rail. With the increased stress, we're going to see extinction and we're seeing hybridization of all kinds of animals now because their habitats overlap. This is just the most classic, amazing example is grizzly and polar bears are now interbreeding. So are wolves and coyotes. Both are in, now interbreeding with wild dogs that run around out in the countryside. Some bird species and disease organisms are increasing their range. And as we all know, with the use of, of various um, medicines that many organisms, including COVID, uh, are adjusting and becoming immune. So we really have to pay attention to what we're doing. Almost nothing we do now on a big scale can be taken for granted as having no effect. We have broken the planet and now we own it. And we've really, really got to pay attention to what we're doing and what the long-term effects are. And there's a bunch of references. I, you know, this, I think in this day and age, it's important to say I didn't make any of this stuff up. I got it all from what I consider really good, reliable sources. If you're interested in a list of references, I put them on my blog today. So if you go to atoe.blog, there's a bunch of links there to a whole range 
of sources and stories about what's going on with climate change. How are species gonna cope? Whoops, I already did this one, went the wrong way. Heat makes some eggs hatch earlier, but not all eggs are affected. They're just starting now around the world to do research on what the heat affects eggs. Certain nesting habits may not work anymore if the temperature goes up three, five, 10 degrees in a particular uh, habitat zone. Uh, birds may not be able to nest the way they used to. Uh, some birds will be able to adjust, others won't. Cavity nesters may have the least danger as far as we understand what goes on. On the other hand, if you've got eggs in a cavity in a tree on the south side and the sun's beating down and it's 10 degrees too hot, there's nothing the female bird is gonna be able to do about that. Uh, and the effects of heat is probably gonna be the worst in the Arctic and in the tropics. It may not be as bad in Oregon as it is in Alaska or Ecuador. Polar effects are quite extreme. We all know about the melting ice, uh, how that's going to affect the birds that live in the North Pole and the South Pole and the Arctic and Antarctic regions, we really don't know yet. Uh, it could affect migration. It's certainly gonna affect food supply. Uh, any birds that really depend on extreme cold and ice sheets uh, are gonna have a hard time surviving. Um, one of the longest annual migrations of any bird in the world is the Arctic Tern. It's right up there with the sooty shearwater and, the, and the, some of the godwits. Uh, and how they're going to be affected by warmer winters, uh, longer summers, we really don't know. If they hang out too long, are they going to get down the coast of California in the fall and find that the food supply they depend on is gone? If the upwelling di disappears along the California and Oregon coast, even if their migration isn't affected, will they still find the same food supply? These are all really complicated interrelated systems of ocean currents, weather, food supply, plankton, acidic ocean, migration timing. I mean, just trying to run this, this is worse than trying to plan a hurricane route. When you start looking at what the computer models would have to be for what might affect the Arctic turn migration, it's very, very complicated. And if we're not willing to spend the time and effort and money to try to figure this out for most of the species on the planet, there's going to be a lot of, oh my God, they were here yesterday. Where are they now? So we really have to start paying attention to this stuff. And this, this is one of the all-time, this is a Ross's gull, an Arctic bird. Uh, the latest study of Arctic species said that 16 of the species that breed above the Arctic circle are considered in danger. And 47 of the 48 species that live in the boreal forest which is the northernmost tier of forest before it gives out and turns into tundra and taiga. They consider they're all extremely vulnerable to climate change. Point Blue has been studying California birds and much of this is relevant to us. They think these are the five most threatened species uh, in the Western United States below the Canada border. Uh, the varied thrush because it depends on damp forests uh, between fire and drought, that could be a real problem. White crowned sparrows need mostly fog drenched coastal scrub. Uh, if you've ever been at Malheur in September, you see them coming through from Alaska, from the tundra and the taiga in the hundreds of thousands. But if that gets too dry, the shrubs die off, the uh, caribou get starved and they eat things down to the ground, the white crowned sparrow is not easily adaptable. It's not gonna just move into a different kind of habitat, you know, like a house sparrow will or a Eurasian collar dove or an American robin. They really need a particular kind of habitat. Same is true of fox sparrow, depends on much the same kind of habitat as the buried thrush. Clark's nutcracker is a special case. They need certain species of pine trees to do well. The pine beetle is the number one enemy of the Clark's nutcracker. And if they can't find the right pine seeds, they can't survive. They're not going to be able to compete with a Stellar's jay that basically can eat anything, or even the Canada jay. So they really need healthy pine forests in the mountains in order to survive. And if those pine forests start going away, these guys are not going to do okay in a forest full of Douglas fir and, and cedar. McGillivray's warbler uh, is a old forest bird. It needs mature, tall conifers. 
uh, and it's very specific about the kind of insects it can eat. They're already finding it being replaced. Uh, pardon me, it doesn't need, it doesn't nest in the tall pine forest, but it needs the tall forest to protect the wet kind of uh, valleys and canyons and marshes that it breeds in. And if it starts getting drier and the undergrowth willows start going away, the McGillivray's warbler is not going to be able to survive. It can't come down in the valley and compete with the yellowthroat. It really needs these protected marshes in the mountains, and those marshes depend not only on rainfall and snowmelt, but they also depend on enough shade to keep the trees that protect the water from dying. Oregon birds, we have 44 species that are declining in the state, according to the latest censuses. 136 of them they expect to become threatened within this century. Some of the ones we talked about buried thrush already, mountain bluebird, foxes swift, uh, I used to see when I lived in Ashland, one of the saddest things I'd see, you'd go up to 6,500 feet on Mount Ashland and there's Western bluebirds nesting in the parking lot. The mountain bluebirds have just been pushed another two to 3,000 feet up higher in the mountains. There are now mountain bluebirds nesting regularly at four to five to 6,000 feet in the Siskiyous and the Southern Cascades. That is only going to get worse for the mountain bluebird. And just like the Stellar Jay versus Clark's Nutcracker, Western Bluebird is much more adaptable, eats a much wider variety of foods, much more used to different kinds of plants, animals, vegetables, insects, and fruit. The Mountain Bluebird is really given to eating what they find in the mountains. Uh, in Eastern Oregon, they almost entirely depend on junipers. If the junipers start dying out or other plants start coming in, they're gonna have a hard time surviving. The mountain blue, the Western bluebird will move in and say, ah, I can do that. Rufus hummingbird is another one. Ruby crown kinglet needs mature forests. Right now I've got one in my front garden, so I'm really happy. And sage grouse. We all know the problems with the sage grouse. Loss of habitat, uh, the reduction of sagebrush. Uh, it's now protected, but it really, really depends on habitat. There are only two animals in Eastern Oregon that can actually eat the leaves of sagebrush and get nutrition, the sage grouse and the pronghorn. So if the sage has problems, starts dying out or getting pushed aside by other plants, this bird is gonna have a really hard time surviving. Scale quail, when you go further south, also having a really hard time for the same reason. Sagebrush is shrinking. It's not well protected. A lot of it's in flat land that you can you can take a chain across it and plant grass and run your cattle in and the sagebrush doesn't come back. White-headed woodpecker is another one that's threatened by global warming. Very specific habitat needs. And if the habitat changes radically, it's unlikely that this bird will be able to adapt the way say a flicker or a hairy woodpecker can. Hermit warbler needs really tall conifers at high altitude. It's now being pushed out by the Townsend warbler that is much more adaptable, they're actually interbreeding as well. But if the higher conifer, mature conifer forests have a hard time because of drought, get wiped up by forest fire, pine trees taken out by beetles, this guy's gonna have a really hard time surviving. Swainson's hawk, double squeeze, he's living habitat both winter and summer. As I said, they have to go all the way to Latin America, most of them. Uh, they need insects, big insects that they can hunt in the winter and they're certainly not gonna find those out in Malher or Klamath Basin in January, but they're also having a really hard time because of habitat loss here. And if the insects start breeding early because of warm summers and drought, and these guys get back in May and the insects are already gone because they've been eaten by the local kestrels and the black phoebe and the nutcrackers and the, and the magpies, they're gonna have a really, really hard time because they can't, obviously can't breed till they get back. And they get a big supply of insects in early summer. And if the insects that are mostly local start breeding earlier, this guy is going to have a hard time adjusting. Pelagic species are facing all kinds of stuff. And it's in addition to the acidic, acidic ocean uh, and warming ocean, if the currents start changing or die down, that's going to have a pro cause serious problems. In 2015, a lot of kelp forests started dying off along the coast, particularly in California and Southern Oregon. If that continues or gets worse and they don't come back, that affects everything from fish to plankton 
to crustaceans, to mollusks, and then of course the birds and the sea otters and the sea lions and the seals that depend on the smaller animals to eat uh, are all going to be radically affected. Uh, some are uh, finding, some animals are finding breeding islands underwater now. Uh, so they go back to their island and the tides are too high. Uh, if Midway becomes flooded, it's going to basically wipe out the Laysan albatross, the largest colony of, the alb of that albatross on the planet. And most of Midway is only a couple of feet above sea level. So even a couple of really bad storms could do damage if they come during breeding season. Uh, and fish and invertebrate populations are being affected by all the change in the ocean. Uh, and as we all know, the ocean is probably the single most complicated natural system with interlocking processes and codependent organisms. It's incredibly complex. And for us to try to figure out what's really going on and is there anything we can do to help it is probably the number one issue. Coral reefs are just an example of the kinds of things that we need to start dealing with if we're going to try to save pelagic animals, not just birds, but all the mammals and the fish. Some birds that are now state birds. Uh, this is a prediction that I saw on one website and there's a link to it on my, on my uh, blog. Uh, so these are some of the state birds that may not make it. One of the most fascinating and saddest are the ptarmigan and the willow ptarmigan is the state bird of Alaska. These are birds that have very little ability to regulate body heat. And if they can't find a patch of snow and the sun is shining on the mountain and the temperature goes up to 75 degrees, and there's no snow left, they die. They can't deal with that. They can't pant. They can't organize their body. There's no way they can change their body. They're really, really well insulated and they specifically need snow patches to survive. Ptarmigan are starting to disappear now from places like Colorado and Wyoming because in the summer, most of the snow's gone, it gets too hot and the birds die. So that's just the most sort of egregious example of what climate change can do to certain, certain birds. Uh, some of these birds is just mostly habitat loss. We talked about the mountain bluebird. The lark bunting is very similar. Uh, it lives up in high, cold mountains, meadows, uh, and it needs a certain kind of summer weather. And if that starts to go away and the food, pro the food supply changes, lark bunting isn't going to be able to make it. California quail, a lot of that's um, habitat loss, uh, particularly in urban and suburban and now rural areas. And also, if the brush gets burned down, California quail can't live in open land. They need serious brush habitat to hide in, raise their young in. Uh, so a combination of climate change and habitat loss is really hard on California quail. The green heron is one of our success stories. We should be really proud. They, we think the population may be two or three times what it was 50 years ago. And it's partly because of duck hunters and conservation groups focusing on wetlands so that the ducks wouldn't go away. And this guy was never a target of conservation, but he has really, really enjoyed the fact that we have kept lots of good marshland and conserved others uh, and preserved and even created new ones. And as a result, this guy's doing pretty well. Red-shouldered hawk is one of those species that's coming north. We've now got a few in the Willamette Valley. Uh, when I lived down in Ashland, there was a wonderful little booklet that I used as a Bible. It was a 1975 publication by the BLM and Forest Service of all the birds ever seen and recorded in Jackson County. And what I really loved about it was the birds that weren't listed. Nobody in 1974 had ever seen a red-shouldered hawk in Jackson County. Now they're a common breeding bird, even breed now up at Howard Prairie at 4,500 feet. Red-shouldered hawk loves rats does really well in town if you're not using decon. So these birds, as they move north, will do really well in man-altered altered habitats. In San Francisco, these are the number one ratters in all the city parks. Better than cats, better than coyotes. You'll see these guys sitting in a tree washing the garbage cans. So they'll do really well once they get here. And they're just one of several species that are coming north. Black Phoebe is another one, Northern Mockingbird. They've got great-tailed grackles now nesting in Southern Oregon. When I first saw that bird, I had to go to Las Cruces, New Mexico to see one. They've moved all the way up the coast and they're now in Oregon. So they're coming our way. If they hit the Willamette Valley, they're gonna be all over the place because they've got a big voice, a big ego, uh, 
a big tail and they're really aggressive around other ichthyids. White tail kite, it's another one. They've come north. They're now, they weren't in the 1974, 75 book in Jackson County. Now they're breeding in the valleys. As long as there's voles, white tail kite is perfectly happy. Collared dove, we all know the story. Somebody took them to Florida. They flew to the, they, I mean, the Bahamas. They flew to Florida in the 80s. And in less than 45 years, they have conquered the entire continent. They do really well. They basically can eat anything that either is or ever was a plant. And like all members of the pigeon and dove family, really strong flyers. So there's no question that these birds are going to do really well. Probably to the great joy of Cooper's hawks, because most of the feather clumps I find now left by a Cooper's hawk are collared doves. They just don't get it. But they breed so fast, it doesn't matter. Burrowing owl used to be one of the most common birds in the grasslands of California and Oregon, uh, really having a hard time. Uh, probably was all over the Willamette Valley and all over the Sacramento Valley 200 years ago. Now, when you find them out in Malheur, a place like that, it's, it's a cause for great joy. Their population is way down. Audubon Society is now predicting that only a fraction of the summer range for uh, burrowing owls will still be suitable for them late in this century. Uh, actually more winter range and the question becomes can they adapt? In the old days, you go back 120 years, most ranches had a big colony of burrowing owls and they encouraged the dog to leave them alone and they encouraged the owls because the owls were great mousers. In the old days, grain and other things were stored in wooden containers and the mice and the rats just went crazy. So the burrowing owl was the rancher's best friend. But then along came pesticides and poisons and it took the burrowing owl out and the mammals adjust, adjusted. So now we got mice and rats, but we've gotten rid of our burrowing owls. Vesper sparrow is another one that's finding its habitat going down. There's still a few in the Willamette Valley. They would have been 150 years ago, quite common in the grasslands in among the oaks. The ring-billed gull, on the other hand, loves what we do. Get them a picnic table and some garbage and they're a happy bird. I see them flying over Salem all the time now in, this, in the wintertime. I saw three or four of them downtown today. They're gonna do just fine as long as we don't completely trash the habitat. These are birds that are very adaptable. They get along well with us and our dogs and our cats and whatever else, parking lots, you name it. I took this picture at a, at a rest stop in Southern Oregon. And this hummingbird is coming north. Uh, back in 75, when they did that book about Jackson County, they were considered summer visitors. Now, if you go to Ashland or Medford, you know anybody who's a birder with a hummingbird feeder, you might see as many as four males fighting for that hummingbird feeder. Um, and they're quite able to get along in mild winters. So they just turn the thermostat down, go into torpor for a day or two. When it gets back up to about 37 degrees, they're out hunting and, uh, and feeding again. So this is a bird like the white-tailed kite, like the red-shouldered hawk, like mockingbird, like gray-tailed grackle, coming north. This is another species that has nothing to do with Oregon, but I just put it in because I love it. This is a picture on a veranda of a condo on one of the islands in Hawaii. 30 or 40 years ago, we thought the nene was done for. Uh, there was a really all out effort to save the duck, the goose, and now it's back. Sadly, the first time I saw one was in a zoo in London, but now you can go to almost any island in Hawaii and find nene. Uh, this porch, they put, put out food every morning and four of these guys would come up and eat the grain off the porch and then go out and poop in the lawn. So this is proof, living proof, and they were down to just a few dozen. But if we work hard at it and we focus on what we're doing, we can save a lot of these animals. Black Phoebe is another one coming north, Stellar's Jay, uh, very adaptable, moving up in elevation as well as all over uh, settled parts of the state of Oregon. Uh, Northern Mockingbird, uh, breeding in all over lowland California. The first one wasn't seen in San Francisco until 1932. Uh, they weren't seen in Southern Oregon until sometime after 1974. Uh, there's now even a few occasionally seen down around the Eugene area. I think once they, once they get established here, they'll do just fine. Uh, when I was growing up, they were a bird of the deep south. Uh, you would never see them in a place like Chicago or Milwaukee or New York. Uh, now they're breeding as far north as Minneapolis and Boston. So this is, a, this is an adaptable, smart, uh, urban 
capable bird that will do really well when they get established as long as we don't completely trash the habitat. American Robin's another one. Uh, I know from living in California, it went, originally before the white man got here, this was a mountain bird. It would go to the coast in the fall, but it bred up in the forests in the mountains. First breeding record along the coast of California was in 1913. Now we've got resident populations all along the lowlands uh, of Oregon and California, not unlike what's happened with the Canada goose. Fox sparrow, they've moved their wintering grounds more than 300 miles north. They feed on the ground, so they do perfectly fine in Kentucky or Southern Illinois or Northern Oregon, uh, as long as it's not snowing. They're only gonna go as far as they gotta go to find food. So again, they're like the siskin, the waxwing, the flicker, the fairy thrush. They're looking for food and if they find it and they can continue to get to it, they're not gonna fly another 300 miles to New Mexico. What's the point? If I can feed on the ground in Portland, I'm gonna be perfectly content. Great tail Graco, we've talked about him a couple of times. Uh, this is on the left is the map for great tail Graco that still appears on uh, birds online. The right hand map is an eBird map and it shows you that the map on the left is only about 15 years old, but it's completely pointlessly out of date. If you look on the right now, you can see where these guys are actually breeding. So a, lesson, a word to the wise, the internet does not always have updated information. You've got to really search for the best possible source. And I love, um, Birds on, American Birds Online are now World Birds Online, but the maps are hopelessly out of date as I found when I was working on the Great Gray Owl books. So if you wanna know what's really going on with the species, particularly in North America, you gotta go to eBird. That's the eBird map on the right for Great Tail Grackle. You can see how far north it's moved. And this is in less than 20 years. So imagine what they could do once they get really established in the Willamette Valley and move up into the Puget Sound area. I would expect to see them all the way to Vancouver maybe even within my lifetime. There's a breeding bird survey map that I found on one, one website on the left for great tail grackle. Look how totally out of date that is. Doesn't even show it well established in the Central Valley. Tricolored blackbird is moving north, but it's losing much of its range to the south. Uh, the question will be, will there be enough big mammals in enough protected marshes for this bird to make it because it's really only in Oregon, California, a little bit of Nevada and Northern Mexico. So it's got a very, very limited range. Another sign that a bird could be in trouble like hermit warbler. If you've got a limited range and you've got to make it within that habitat and it changes too much, you don't have a choice. Crows, robins, flickers, morning doves, they're all over the place. So maybe they'll get wiped out in 14 states but they'll move into three other areas not going to happen with tricolored blackbirds. They're down 80% in the last seven decades. Very small range. Back in the 19th century when elk ran around, they were the elk bird. Just like the cowbird was the bison bird in the Great Plains, these guys were the elk bird on the Pacific Slope and they followed the big elk herds all over the place. Well, we know what happened to the elk. Western meadowlark, no longer common in this valley, uh, still common in the drier less agricultural areas of Oregon. Um, we're gonna have, you know, this is a bird you're gonna have to pay attention because just like in the East, this bird is totally dependent on this kind of habitat. And if we plow it all under and farm it and spray it and pave it, these guys are not gonna have a very good chance of survival. Short eared owl, sharp population decline. We still get them in the winter coming in from Eastern Oregon. They need, undisturbed, unmown flatlands because they breed on the ground and they hunt on the ground. And to try to find that kind of habitat for a bird this size is no longer easy. Back in 2009, Audubon started working on climate change. Uh, this is some of the stuff they found uh, and all of it's still true. These trends, however, are accelerating as we know from from stories about weather and hurricanes and forest fires and stuff, uh, temperatures, you know, the hottest August on record, all that stuff. It's happening faster than anybody would have thought back in 2009. And that means the changes in bird habitat and population is gonna happen faster than we expected. Here's the one thing they found, the purple finches was 10 years ago was the winter. 
uh, in terms of moving north. Uh, they basically need access to certain kinds of seeds and not too harsh a winter weather. Uh, so they just don't uh, migrate as much as they used to. They just, they go far enough to get to a decent place where there's a food supply and stay. North, here are the northward population winners, uh, the population winners for moving north. Uh, when they did that survey 10 years ago, purple finch, of course, wild turkey doesn't surprise me either. They can eat anything on the ground. As long as there's not too much snow, they're gonna do just fine. Not native, uh, introduced for hunting. Uh, this guy is doing really well in semi-wild uh, oak forests and other kinds of habitat where they can find food. Uh, seabirds, on the other hand, are having a hard time. Uh, it's not just climate change, it's pollution, overfishing. Uh, Almost everything that's going on in the ocean is not good for a lot of these small birds, the alcids, the albatross, the shearwaters. Most of them are gonna have a hard time over the next 20 to 30 years. And that's we really focus on what's going on with them. And most of them aren't big dramatic birds like the brown, brown pelican. I mean, 99% of the people in the world wouldn't know a Casson's awkward if it landed on their car. So it's not gonna be easy to stir up um, interest as it was with bald eagles and brown pelicans and osprey and stuff back with PDT. The 2015 El Nino, we hope it was just a one-off, you know, every 20, 30 years, they can, they can uh, live through that. But if it really starts happening every second or third year, it's gonna be really hard. Most of the ocean birds live 10 years or longer. Some of the albatrosses we know will live decades. So if they lose one year of nesting, it's not like it would be for hummingbird or a pine siskin. But if they start losing every other year, there's no way they can make up for that partly because their food supply is not gonna bounce back from year to year. If the food supply and the kelp forests and stuff are damaged, then the whole population is gonna suffer for longer than just the year when there was an El Nino. Some shorebirds, we talked about that, are way down in the East Coast, it's the red knot. It's one of the bigger herders, um, populations way down. Snowy plover, we know about them. They breed here on the West Coast. We're doing our best to try to protect their nesting sites. Um, some COVIDs are having a hard time. Uh, the yellow-billed magpie almost got wiped up by West Nile. It's starting to come back because the population now is fairly resistant. Uh, and then the pinion jay, uh, it's an inland dry habitat jay and it really, really, really does need pinion and other pines. And if they're killed off by beetles and drought, like the nutcracker, there's no way this guy is gonna make it. Corvids do a lot of good work. There's a wonderful book I recommend called Landscaping Ideas of Jays. Uh, and they help replant the forests. And what's gonna happen in, in lower areas where the Ponderosa died off in California and parts of Southern Oregon is the scrub jay is gonna come in, he's gonna plant oaks. Uh, and it's gonna be a scrub jay forest. It's not gonna be a nutcracker or a stellar jay forest. Um, we're starting to see keratin disorder. This is a, a red-breasted uh, nuthatch that I found in my garden a couple years ago. They think it might be related to, to climate stress, uh, but it's becoming more and more common. There's all kinds of, of eye and beak diseases and finches as well. Uh, they also think that's probably related to stress and climate change. So we're gonna, we're gonna see all kinds of stuff that nobody predicted 20 years ago. Uh, globally, there's loss of habitat, particularly in Asia. Drought is happening periodically everywhere. Uh, this little guy, Spoonbill Sandpiper, is maybe one of the first species to go extinct in this dec coming decade. Uh, it really is hurting and climate change is just making it worse. There are a lot of success stories. Uh, this is a short summary, but we know what most of them are. Uh, the Kirtland's Warbler is starting to come back a little bit. We saved the hooded Oriole, uh, Osprey, Bald Eagle, Pelican, California Condor. Uh, when, I, when they trapped the last ones, I thought I would never see one flying in the wild. You go to uh, Big Sur now and, or um, some of the inland parks and spend enough time, you're going to see condors soar over your head and it's still the most amazing sight in the North American wildlife. Just absolutely incredible. And at least we're paying attention now. Some of the extinctions that happened in the last 50, 60 years, nobody was really paying attention. Bachman's Warbler, what is it? Who cares? Eskimo Curlew came and went. It was almost like it didn't, didn't even exist to begin with in the human mind. 
So at least we're much more aware now. We've got much better data and we've got computers to help us load in all the stuff that we need to look at, all the variables to get some sense of what's really going on. Uh, ornithology lab at Cornell is finding that some of the birds are really, really, really adapting already. Uh, very quickly, black-throated blue warbler is one. Um, they're just expanding their habitat. Uh, purple martins are an example here in Oregon and Northern California, many more than there were, partly because we're putting up these scores, but also they just do really well. They breed early. Uh, so they're here for the early explosion of insects that might not have happened till June or July before, but they like to breed early because it takes them longer to raise their young. So early summers are just exactly what the purple martin ordered. Double crested cormorants, doing fine. As long as we don't pollute the water, they're gonna do really well. Uh, and of course, these guys are classic examples of how to bring back species. Banning DDT allowed the bald eagle and the peregrine to become almost everyday birds in vast reaches of North America. Whereas 40 years ago, the DDT ban took place in 74. By 73, these were birds that most people never expected to see alive in the 48 states. And here's some more that we saved. The condor, uh, griffin vulture down here on the left, that's in Europe. Uh, they're now spreading them out in the, in the uh, Alps because they saved some in Spain almost by accident on, a, on a, what was used to be a royal hunting preserve. Turned out there were lots of griffin vultures, but now they're transplanting them back to where they used to be. Uh, whooping crane, of course, and the white-faced duck, which is, a, as you can tell, a cousin of the ruddy duck, and they have exterminated the invasive ruddy duck in Europe to save the white-faced duck. You break it, you own it. Uh, I don't know what else I can say. We have three billion fewer birds than we do in 1970. So we're gonna to have to pay attention if we wanna keep them around. And it's up to us. It's a nice quote. Um, she's a, a climate scientist. The earth is going to survive. Question is, are we gonna cut off the branch we're sitting on? So I'm out and ready for any questions. Okay, looks like I'm unmuted. Yes, I'm you to are. Your I can hear you. Chairperson of Birders Night, and I'm going to be posing the questions to okay. Harry. I'll which, do my best. Uh, which I know is very good, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad. Uh, that was an enormous amount of material. And I've got lots and lots of notes, but I know you're gonna give us a lot more to think about. And Tim Johnson has the first question. He wants to know, to what extent can yard feeders, plantings and water features help with the loss of habitat and the loss of birds? Uh, enormously. I mean, if any of you know Stephanie Hayes and you can talk to her about what's going on trying to save monarchs, that's just, and no pun intended, a small example of what we can all do. Uh, whether it's in your garden, whether it's in the city park, um, wherever. Habitat uh, depends on some things we can't control like what the weather and climate's gonna do, but we can supply water. We can find food bearing plants or insect attracting plants that will survive as the climate changes. Um, and it's going to be really, really important for us to do that. And there are a lot of birds that are comfortable enough around people that if there's the right kind of food supply and there's water and the kind of protection they need, you know, like quail need thickets, uh, other birds need uh, cavities in trees. So if we can keep the park cleanup crews from cutting down all the dead limbs so that nuthatches and woodpeckers have a place to drill holes, Yes. I think these birds can do really well. There are a number of birds that do quite well around people. Now, we're not going to be able to survive, save all of them. Uh, you know, Spotted Owl, Clark Nutcracker, some of the ones that just can't live in suburbia are going to have a hard time no matter what we do. But there are a lot of birds that will do fine. And I think, you know, think of the flicker, think of the robin, 
think of the scrub jay, uh, think of various common sparrows like song sparrow. We all know what they need and it's not that hard to provide it for them. Next question, Carolyn Homan asks, why is the American goldfinch disappearing in Iowa? Habitat loss, pesticides, what is it? Um, it's a combination of both. Uh, one of the things, when I grew up in the Midwest, most um, ed field edges and roadsides were thickets of blackberries and sassafras and poison ivy and all that kind of stuff that was like the hedgerows in Europe, only more informal. And the hedgerows in Europe were originally built instead of fences. So they were hundreds of years old. Well, in the Midwest, you didn't farm up to the edge of the road. You farmed up sort of the edge of the field. Maybe you put in a fence or you just let the scrub grow in the corners of the field. And they don't do that anymore. Partly it's economic. Partly it's industrial agriculture. You've got huge corporations that don't give a damn about the American goldfinch. They just want an extra half acre of soybeans. So you've got that going on and you've got the economics. When you're spraying a field with toxins, you're not doing it by hand with a little spray bottle. You're doing it either with an airplane or you do it with a gigantic tractor and the stuff goes off the edge of the field, into the ditches, onto the shrubs that might still be there if they're there. And so it's a combination of loss of habitat, which is exactly what happened to the monarch butterfly. People wanted to kill off those horrible weeds that they eat because milkweed is a weed, so we got to get rid of it, so let's spray it with a poison. Uh, and the same thing is happening with goldfinches. Goldfinches love thistles. You say the word thistle on an industrial agriculture plot in Nebraska or Iowa, and they're going to go nuts. There's nothing worse than a thistle in the middle of your, of your crop. So they spray them with stuff that kills the thistles. Well, if, it, if the poison doesn't directly kill the goldfinch, it helps it starve to death. Yes. Uh, before I read a couple more questions, I want to remind the audience that you folks are the ones who are going to provide questions for Harry and expand your input of his vast range of knowledge. So go to your chat, which is the conversation bubble at the bottom of your screen if you're on an, um, a computer or at the upper right hand corner, maybe out beyond three dots if you're on an iPad. Okay, the next question is, are there any estimates of how many birds have been lost in the Oregon forest fires? No, and uh, it's interesting because until this year, um, there was very little even attempt to research the effect of forest fires on bird populations. There was sort of indirect information because of breeding bird surveys and that sort of thing, but there was never any sort of focused, concentrated effort. Let's go in right now uh, and for the next 10 to 20 years and see what's really happened. There's good anecdotal stuff from areas that have burned, particularly in national parks, uh, that most birds uh, survive the fire. The question is what happens to them next? Can they find a territory? They obviously can't go back to where they were uh, three months ago because it's all burned over and there's likely to be no food. There's only a few species that really like recent burns. Blackback woodpecker is one of them because they go in and they get the bugs that immediately move into the recently killed trees. But you know, your fox sparrow, your varied thrush, your red-breasted nuthatch, um, your red-breasted sapsucker, those, those guys are not going to be able to make a living in a forest that's been burned. Uh, and the same for grassland. I mean, a meadowlark is not going to go into a field that burned two weeks ago and find anything to eat. So there's, there's a, a question of, can, is there habitat they can go into and survive? How quickly does the habitat return so that some bird can live there? Uh, in general, we don't really know until this year. I don't think anybody in this country at least even thought about what this smoke effect would be of covering half a continent with forest fire smoke. But now we realize that it could be really uh, endangering to all kinds of migrants. Uh, most local birds will escape the fire. Uh, if, they're, if it's after nesting season and all the birds can fly, 
uh, in general, they can go at least 30, 35 miles an hour. And only on rare cases um, will a bird get trapped. Uh, I called two or three of the rescue places in Southern Oregon when the fire's really bad. And they had uh, like four birds. Uh, and there was uh, a couple of wild turkeys, uh, probably youngsters that couldn't fly very well. And they're in the forest anyway. But you know, your average raven or flicker or swallow or sparrow, they're gonna get the hell out of there the minute they smell smoke. I mean, they really do panic and run. But the question is what happens to them afterwards? Where are they gonna find food? Uh, a lot of times now the fires are happening about the same time or just before migration. And that puts enormous stress on every bird that's got to migrate. If they just lost a week's worth of food and they're barely surviving, they're not going to make it to Costa Rica. Thank you. That's pretty devastating to think about when you think how they have to pile on the fat. Yes, yeah. Michael yeah. Babbitt asks, it seems changes in ocean chemistry may be worse than warming. Comments? Yes. yes, yeah, ocean acidification is going to be a huge problem. Well, they already think it's largely to blame for the dying off of coral reefs. Uh, carbon dioxide is water soluble. You add carbon dioxide to the ocean and you get an acid and it's, it's going to eat into all kinds of things. It, it, it could endanger mollusks and shellfish as a class of an organism. And if that happens, um, that's going to affect, you know, everything from surf scoters to sea lions uh, and, and sea otters. If sea otters can't find abalone to eat, they're going to stop eating. They're just going to go on strike because that's their favorite food. Uh, I, I jest to a certain extent. But, and also it's going to affect plankton, the small stuff. Um, acidic water is just extremely different. Now, there are some organisms that will do fine. There may be some algae uh, and some... Um, small animals and plants that will do okay in acidic water, but it's not gonna be the kind of mix we have now. And it's gonna, again, it's gonna create enormous stress and it's gonna require adaptation. And not every species can do that. I mean, we know that virus and bacteria uh, and certain other organisms can adapt really quickly because they have three or four generations a week. But if you've got a sea lion, he's not quite as slow as we are, but they're not gonna adapt. They're just not. Uh, and, and strange things are going to be happening. Um, the, the, there's going to be uh, asexual reproduction. Um, you know, they've now got organisms, I think it's in the canals of the Netherlands, uh, that are uh, crayfish that are reproducing without sex. Uh, they developed them in a lab. Somebody turned one loose and now there's thousands of them. Uh, every one of them is pregnant from the time it's born. Uh, and they don't need to mate. So you, things like that are going to start happening that we haven't predicted because it's sort of outside the normal, but this is not going to be normal anymore. I mean, whoever thought polar bears and, and grizzly bears would crossbreed. So we're going to see stuff that we have no way to predict. It's just going to happen, and then we're going to have to deal with it. Kathy Patterson asks, where do white-tailed kites go in the spring and summer for breeding habitat? I see a pair in South Polk County in fields, but yes. not in the summer. Right, they uh, breed around here. They would probably breed along streams in Aspen or Alder or Cottonwoods. They don't like conifers, uh, so they like uh, pretty densely foliaged um, trees that are deciduous. They don't particularly like oaks either because there's too much space in there. So you, they might go into a cottonwood if there's poplars around. They would go into a poplar if somebody's planting, but they, they like uh, the kinds of deciduous trees that grow densely and fairly tall along water. So they're not going to, they're not going to nest in a 15 foot high red osier dogwood or a 12 foot willow. They're going to go into the 60 foot cottonwood. They're going to go up to the top of an alder or an aspen. And they, but they need to be near lots of fields because even when they're raising young, they're going out catching voles and bringing them back. Thank you. Eliz Linzer asks, how did the migratory birds fare along the Gulf 
and areas affected by multiple tropical storms and hurricanes. Well, there's no question that when a really big storm hits, um, they've got winds that are very fast that birds can't outlive. There's always a uh, bird kill off in something like a tornado or a hurricane. Uh, fortunately, most of the hurricanes happen after nesting season, but even adult birds uh, can't always deal with that. And, when, and the, the other thing that happens, of course, in hurricanes and tornadoes is that they tear up sections of habitat. Uh, tornadoes, not as much as a hurricane because a tornado tends to be fairly focused, but a hurricane can you know, cut a two to 400 mile swath through a forest, marsh, grassland, you name it. Uh, and so it can do enormous amount of damage. Now, if, if it's moving slowly enough, and some of these really big ones move extremely slow, there was one I was watching, it was moving four miles an hour or something like that this summer. There's no question that the birds can get away from that because they can sense the change in air pressure and they can certainly outfly that. But if you get one that's moving really fast, uh, and let's say the, the, they always move to the northeast is always the first section of the hurricane to hit. And let's say they make the, sec the mistake of moving west and then all of you know, they've been flying for two hours and then the west end comes in and they're t exhausted, they're hosed. There's nothing, they're not gonna outrun a hurricane, you know, an 80, 90, 140 mile an hour wind. So it's partly, do they guess right? Do they have some instinct that tells them you better fly north? You better get away from the Gulf, even though you're a shorebird or you're a gull. You know, a laughing gull in, in Northern Florida, is it gonna fly 400 miles into Georgia? To get away from a hurricane or is it going to just try to move down the coast like it used to be able to do and its grandparents did. So that'll be the question. And I think the really smart birds will adjust really quickly. The crows are going to say, okay, we're getting the hell out of here. We're heading for the mountains. But your ordinary bird is not going to be able to figure that out. The starlings will probably adjust too. Oh yes. They can adjust almost anything. Um. What bird species is being most affected by climate change in the Willamette Valley? I'm not sure whose question that is, but. Okay. Um, I would say the, the birds that depend on open grassland uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, you're gonna see more and more irrigation here um, for crops. Uh, as it gets drier and hotter. Uh, and once you've irrigated a crop, you're gonna, if you're trying, if what you're after is profit, and that's where the whole name of this thing comes from, it's really profit versus the planet now. And we're gonna have to measure, weigh our system and say, okay, how important is it to make profit on this? And how important is it to save the planet? And we haven't gotten there yet, but we're gonna have to get there or our grandparents or our grandkids will, because you gotta, at some point you gotta say, okay, is it worth the extra, $4,000 worth of spray on this hazelnut orchard so I get a bigger crop and make a little bit more money? Or is it better off that I don't spray, kill all the animals and the insects? Maybe you make a little bit less money and maybe the government will, will subsidize me to do that and we'll have an organic crop and maybe the meadow larks can nest in the grass in between the trees. So that's the kind of thing we're gonna have to look at. But right now in the Willamette Valley, like most flat areas of America, the grassland birds are the ones that are really hurting. Most of the birds that are not grassland birds can move into town, move into parks, go into the wildlife refuges. So the flicker and the downy woodpecker are probably doing just fine. Uh, but the meadowlark, the western bluebird, the savanna sparrow, the lark sparrow, uh, the vesper sparrow, these guys that, you know, 200 years ago, there would have been a zillion of them in the Willamette Valley. Nor I'm sure there were loggerhead shrike here if you went back far enough, burrowing owls. Why not? Perfect habitat, but not anymore. Dominic Valenti wants to know, is the recent expansion of barred owls into spotted owl territory connected with climate change? I've not seen any evidence that it is. I think it's much more likely it has to do with our forestry and logging uh, habits where we're opening up forests uh, and the barred owl, you know, like the collared dove, uh, like the starling, does really well around people. They can live in town. 
uh, you know, <laughs> the ones here in Salem that were attacking walkers in the park. I mean, they do really well around people and they have a, a very, very broad range of things they can eat. Uh, and they're not nearly as persnickety about their habitat and their privacy as the spotted owl. And the way they've moved across uh, the, the continent tends to indicate it's probably not global warming because they came across the northern tier. They went, you know, Minnesota through mixed forest, British Columbia, and then they moved south. They were here before they were in California. They were in Washington and Vancouver, BC before they were here. So it tends to be the fact looks like that they came with habitat change uh, and not so much climate change. The ones coming from the south, uh, you can guess that at least part of that is climate change, that they're just, they're moving north. They, you know, they, there were California thrasher in Jackson County calling for a mate last year. There is no record in history of California thrashers nesting in Oregon. Okay, then the next question, which birds are most affected by the decline in pine forests and which have shown that they can move into neighboring environments? Well, the ones, the, the ones that are gonna be most affected are uh, birds that either get food and or nesting sites, primarily in pines. Um, and if they're confined to the mountains, it's gonna hurt even more. Red crossbills or crossbills, since there's probably seven species, are classic examples. Some of them are mountain birds, but if you go to the coast of Oregon and you, you look at the coastal pines, there's, there's red crossbills nesting at six feet above sea level. Well, they're not going to be nearly as badly affected uh, unless the pine beetle takes to the fog and starts killing those dune pines. But um, crossbills, pine siskins, Clark's nutcrackers, some of the woodpeckers really need pine trees. Um, and it's going to be really hard on them if pine trees as a class of forest start to disappear completely. Uh, the, the pine beetle isn't as bad this far north as it is south, but if you ever get to travel again and you go to Yosemite, there are no ponderosas left in the foothills. It's oak and cedar and scrub and willows and whatever else can grow, but the ponderosas are just gone. They've cut them all down now because they were huge fire danger, but they were dying four or five years ago. So to find even a baby ponderosa now near Yosemite is a really big deal. And we're gonna see very quickly what that means because those, the populations that depend on those pines are either gonna move or vanish from whole areas. Uh, on the other hand, the, you know, the, the more flexible birds, you know, the red-breasted nuthatch, uh, the flickers, the stellar's jays, they're gonna do okay because they're gonna adjust to whatever comes in. Uh, it's the ones that really depend on pine trees, either for food uh, or for a place to nest that are gonna suffer the most. Carolyn ha Holman has a question on how we are to move forward trying to lessen some of these bad things you're telling us about. Well, we can, you know, as, as Tim hinted earlier, there's stuff we can do as individuals. Um, with, if we have a little plot of land or if we can volunteer or work or help at, you know, a reserve or a park or any place where we can do something for the local habitat to help the local birds. And on the bigger scale, um, you know, it just takes organization and it takes political will. And, and we'll see um, if this country and other countries can get it together to cooperate. Um, our species is not particularly good at, at widespread cooperation. We're really good in the tribe, but uh, we're not so good when you get out of the tribe. So we'll see. It's gonna, it, we're going to face really serious issues. I mean, when somebody asks me about climate change, I say, here's, here's the one question you have to ask in your mind and try to come up with an answer and then backtrack to what it's going to take to deal with it. And I always say that the number one issue long-term for climate change, Bangladesh has a very, very low elevation as a country. Who's gonna take 90 million impoverished Bangladeshi? New Zealand has already agreed they're gonna take all the Tongans, but that's not very many, it's not a big deal. But who's gonna take 90 million Bangladeshi? 
You got people now who go crazy over immigration and refugees. We have just begun. Well, Carolyn's question is a political one. What's, okay. the, what's the best economic argument to use to support saving habitat for birds? I know that not spraying is not going to be accepted without a counter argument. We're having a hard enough time saving bees right. and their economic be benefit is pretty well known. What's right. the best economic argument, she asked. Well, I would say one simple one, a bumper sticker is a barn swallow, one barn swallow eats 2000 mosquitoes a day. But the bigger argument is that if the birds uh, start disappearing en masse and species start going away, the habitat starts to disintegrate. And we've, we've gotten to the use of thinking of, of man versus nature, but we can't live without it. We're part of it. I mean, we can pretend that we're better and we're above and we're chosen and, you know, God's favorite and all that stuff. But the fact is, if we destroy life on the planet, we're going to be one of the first ones to go because we have a really, we tax this planet very heavily. And if if the ecosystems start to fall apart, we're not going to make it. I mean, it, it, it should be enlightened self-interest for us to deal with climate change. I don't think you'll find any argumentation amongst this group, but we all know that there are lots of other forces. Well, there's, yeah, there's a lot of forces, there's lots of propaganda coming from both corporations and certain political beliefs. Um, and, you know, there, there are people who think we're somehow above it all and outside it. And all I can say is I pity your grandchildren. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Harry. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. As usual.